Howdy, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Fireblocks. Love, love, love this company. You'll be hearing all about them later from me later in the episode. But now, on with the show. We always make our biggest changes during times of crisis. We need times when we clear out uh, institutions and allow new institutions to flourish and, and resources to be allocated to new agendas. Mm-hmm. And and poor attorneys do solve that one way or another to get us beyond that. And I, I think that's the lesson of history. As well. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of On the Margin. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest, um, Mr. Neil Howe, author of The Fourth Turning. Neil, welcome to the show. Hey, uh, great, great to be here, um, uh, honestly. It's, it's an honor to have you. Um, you know, I think you're, of, of all of the guests on the show, you're one of the most requested uh, over the years. Uh, at a certain point, you know, you just got to give the people what they want. So here we are <laughs> chatting um, and I'm excited to, get in, excited to get into it with you. Um, you know, I think just kind of starting from a high level here, I think you've inspired uh, a lot of people with your work, right? And it's very often cited uh, kind of concept, especially on, you know, Twitter and in financial circles and stuff like that. But can you just kind of take us back, right? Like what made you initially excited to look into generational theory, kind of give us a sense of what that is? I kind of had to discover it, um, you know, <laughs> particularly when when Bill and I were writing in the late 1980s. Uh, that's really when we got together and started collaborating. Um, uh, generational theory, was really unknown. <laughs> Long been in dormancy. I mean, uh, there, and there actually, uh, there is an important body of generations writing uh, in the modern West, uh, particularly in um, in uh, starting the late seventeenth century, eighteenth uh, excuse me, late eighteenth century, nineteenth century, and early twentieth century. Uh, but really following the 1930s, particularly in post-war America, it pretty much completely uh, was abandoned. Uh, uh, despite the fact that everyone from, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, John Stuart Mill and William Deltai and, and all these great uh, uh, social theorists and, and, and social scientists um, talked about it. Uh, certainly, uh, Ortega Gasset and Max Weber, and you know, in other words, you go down and uh, the the, the uh, 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 particularly uh, uh, Northern European uh, Northern European theorists, <clears throat> and then it and then it just sort of stopped. I, in my lifetime, generational theory, uh, just thinking about generational differences. Uh, suddenly rebounded hugely in the late 1960s and 1970s. Mm. That was the time of the famous uh, generation gap, uh, which uh, all baby boomers remember. And it was really a, a, uh, an extraordinary experience, uh, this enormous gulf in values. Uh, anyone who goes back, if you want to get an example of that, you can go back and, and look at old uh, uh, replays of All in the Family. <laughs> I want to go back and look at you know Archie Bunker and Meathead and 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 just just shouting everyone in the household just shouting each other I mean just complete discord and 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 high passions right constant argument and it was extraordinary because it was new uh, no one had experienced that really in the same way in the in the early sixties you know the fifties the forties. Uh, in fact, the GI generation, which was then in sort of, you know, late midlife or getting up, getting on, beginning to retire, thinking about retiring, uh, had never experienced that in their entire life. They had no idea what that was. Completely blindsided them to have all these kids who were just suddenly so spiteful, ungrateful. That we built all this for you. And look at it. You just spit at it. <laughs> Everything about it. You know, uh, uh, you know this, this meant, uh, you know, the, the famous Churchill symbol. Uh, was, uh, uh, you know, V for victory, and suddenly it was peace, you know, and we, we won, we won World War II with, uh, with uh, flamethrowers and, 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 uh, and, and, and firebombs, but suddenly that was like the worst atrocity the world had ever committed, you know, in Vietnam, right? So, in other words, you go down all of these things, uh, and everything that generation did uh, the GIs got their hair short, so boomers could, you know, let their hair grow. I mean, yeah, and it, all of these things was it was it was an affront, particularly large in the culture. I think boomers pretty much let the GIs kind of run institutions, 
Uh, but, but boomers wanted to take over the culture, challenge uh, their parents in the culture. Uh, and I'm sure as all readers will know, that's actually part of a whole generational paradigm for that type of generation, right? Challenging the values, uh, but not so much uh, ultimately wanting to <laughs> re rebuild things. And boomers really aren't much in builders, <laughs> as you may know. I don't, I don't think they could organize their way out of a shoebox. But they're very expressive, and they hugely change the culture. <clears throat> anyway, that was that was my ground zero, and then all of that went uh, after the big chill in the early 1980s. That kind of went into eclipse, um, and uh, people talked a little bit about Generation X, although that really hadn't been coined yet. Uh, Gen X was not coined until 1992 with with the Doug uh, Doug, Doug Kuplin novel, but that was kind of when Bill and I first started writing. We did not, all we wanted to do was talk about the extraordinary differences we saw between um, boomers who were beginning to enter politics, right, at that time, and the generations which had come before. And uh, just in terms of what they wanted to leave behind, right, this, this, this contrast that we had just talked about, at the same age that uh, boomers' parents were uh, you know, building battleships and founding families. Boomers were taking voyages to the interior. You know, <laughs> they were going to Woodstock. You know, that was that was the Boomer D Day. You know, <clears throat> well, that's an extraordinary. So, how did that come about? Have we seen that before in history? And really, that's what we wanted to write about. Uh, there were a few big books coming out on boomers at the time. There's a famous one by Landon Jones. Uh, called Great Expectations. Still a, a very good book, uh, if you know, although it <laughs> kind of came, it sort of ended in the mid 1980s. So it's kind of dated. But if, but if you're sort of interested in sort of the, the youth of, of boomers, it's not bad. But my point is, <clears throat> is that we wanted to look and see a broader view. Why does this happen? Mm. And we wanted to look back in history. So we wanted to actually do something that was sort of a, a look at it, this sort of succession of generational changes throughout American history. So we went back and looked, we had no, we weren't thinking in terms of cycles at all. Uh, but we went back and looked and, and the, the cyclical part, the pattern part was something that simply uh, uh, was sort of like an epiphany. It, it just constantly came up to us as we looked at the data. Because not only did we find that generations going all the way back to the 17th century were very different from each other, that we certainly confirmed, right? Uh, mm. People were very aware of the time that different new, new generations coming of age had very different collective personalities, right? And so that was, that was there. It's, it's huge in New England. I mean, people that realize back in the 1600s in New England, you know, the sort of the early Puritan generations, my God, the, the Jeremiah's were constantly about these kids coming along. They're lost. They're, they're, they have no morality. They, what's happening? They're completely different. And, and they were different, right? That wasn't just old talking about the young. They were different in ways that actually lasted a lifetime. <clears throat> and one thing we wanted to see is, is, is what generates that. Well, one thing we noticed is these, these differences tend to come in a pattern. Mm. That is to say, certain kinds of generations always follow others. For example, one thing you were very familiar with, I think everyone's familiar with it today, is that boomers are very different from Xers. You know, boomers are kind of all into, you know, the transcendent, the ideal. We're very, um, uh, 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 very much uh, into scaling the Maslowian pyramid, you know, <laughs> sort of going up to the ideal, transcending the material. And if there's anything Gen Xers did, it was like completely undercut that, you know, it was all about, uh, uh, I'm sure you, many of us who were there in the 70s remember the song Material Girl and, and you just all the stuff and, you know, hip hop culture was all about pragmatic stuff. It was about the bling, it was about getting rich, it was about succeeding, it was about all the bottom lines of life. And I think one thing that, that Xers hated so much about boomers is they're just hypocrisy. Right, they claim to be all these ideals, but they're just frigging yuppies, right? <laughs> they were just hypocrites. And so the Xers with this, they have this new cynical eye, this new jaundiced eye, this I've been everywhere eye. And that's for a reason, 
because they had a very different kind of childhood. So, but my, my point is, is that that's been characteristic. Every time you have a boomer-like generation, it's followed by that kind of generation, right? Mm. And similarly, every time you have an extra-like generation, it's followed by a millennial-like generation in many ways, right? <clears throat> so that's what we saw. And that pattern, moreover, and this is actually more than we wanted to talk about, <laughs> but again, it kind of overwhelmed us, is that that pattern in turn is related to a a pattern that people just see in history, in the history of major civic events in this country, right? That we tend to have these major civic revolutions or upheavals mm -hmm. uh, about once every long human lifetime. And if you go back, you find the first one that the colonies experienced, and of course that was hugely shared by, uh, by England at the time, which was mainly you know, the, the origin of the vast majority of, of, of North American settlers. Um, was uh, the Glorious Revolution and the War of Spanish Succession, which was an enormous global war, which occurred you know, right at the end of the 17th century, early 18th. And then about a lifetime later, you had the American Revolution and the kind of constitutional era. And then about a lifetime later, it's Civil War and you know, World War II and, and the New Deal. And then today, here we are, right? So that's the basic pattern. And that halfway in between those great civic cataclysms and rebuilding um, are, uh, the great awakenings of American history. And of course, those are the coming of age events mm. or the boomer archetype, what we sometimes call the prophet archetype. Um, and, and now you have what we call the hero archetype, uh, which is you know, participating in the young adults in the current, in the current crisis, right? Um, and these give you an overall outline, but I guess two points here. One is, we did not set out to write about a pattern or a cycle. Uh, we just wanted to write about generational changes. We actually didn't even want to write that much about history, although inevitably this involved history. My own background, um, you know, uh, Bill Strauss's at the time, this is really writing, you know, generations. That was our first book. <clears throat> Came out in 1991. And Bill's background was, um, was, uh, uh, law and public policy. Mm. Uh, and he had written a book that was heavily involved with boomers. It was uh, Chance and Circumstances. Basically, what did boomers do <clears throat> during the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> during the, um, the Vietnam War? <laughs> kind of weird. How many went to Canada? How many uh, uh, lied? How many, you know, injured themselves, whatever, to get out of the draft and sort of, you know, what, what happened to them? Uh, and I, I had written a book called uh, On Borrowed Time. Uh, with Pete Peterson, and that was a book on um, uh, the huge fiscal problems America was facing, you know, these enormous liabilities to the future. And they both involved sort of generational issues. One, the, the fiscal issue was why were boomers so completely um, okay, uh, were, were had no problem with the budget being so oriented to older people? And it really happened really as boomers are coming of age, right? We had this enormous expansion in senior programs. You know, they all got COLA indexing, we had Medicaid, we expanded, we had Medicare, we had all these huge programs which went to rewarding this generation which had won World War II, right? And a, and a generation which, by the way, knew it was deserving <clears throat> ever since the original New Deal. Uh, and, and, and I think all, all Americans at the time still do today uh, but well, yeah, you 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 built this whole thing. <laughs> I guess you should have a large share of whatever it generated. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. you you built all the dams. You you built all the infrastructure. You won the war. <laughs> you you even got us through much of the uh, uh, the Cold War. Uh, you took us to the moon. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, you can you can have all that stuff back, right? Mm -hmm. So that was an interesting uh, compromise, and I think the way it worked out by the end of the 1970s is a boomer says, okay, you can have all the material stuff. We'll vote for that. We'll raise taxes on ourselves to pay for you, right? It's basically a pay as you go system, uh, but you give us the culture. So that was the deal. And so by that time you had Ronald Reagan, Reagan was happy to have Beach Boys come to the White House. And <laughs> so Reagan was happy to have the boomer culture, but the GI institutions, right? And so that's the kind of the that's kind of the ultimate compromise that we had, and um, 
and that and that's kind of how we went into uh, the 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 kind of the fall season of history, what was sometimes called the third turning, right? Which is sort of that uh, that period of sort of uh, deregulation and individualism and uh, uh, declining tax rates and um, greater gap between rich and poor, <laughs> you know, which which we experienced in the in the uh, in the eighties and nineties and early oos, right? Um, and and that was also very seasonal. So that's how I got into this. And I think a lot of the things that, that I've seen um, I, in some ways go back to that coming of age experience. I will say that my own, I mean, if you want to know my own personal background um, <clears throat> and as an undergraduate, uh, I, was, um, I, was a, I was a literature major. So I was, I, I was an English, lit. I mean, my specialty was Milton. So I was, I studied the 17th century. Uh, and later on in graduate school, uh, I studied uh, uh, history and economics. So my major field for doctorate was history. Uh, and I also did uh, all the curriculum and economics. So that was, that was kind of my graduate training. Um, and currently, actually, I'm I'm a uh, you know sector head at, at Hedge Eye Risk Management, so my my clients are actually in markets, and they expect me to know about not just demography but about you know how the economy works. So, um, but to me, I'm very multi, or I should say multi or interdisciplinary. I mean, I I like to put together different disciplines and look at what each has to say to the other, whether it's a religion or a sociology or history. Um, uh, economics, markets. Um, I like to see how all these things tie together. One of, one of the, my favorite things about generational theory in general is it actually rests on this very basic premise, which all of us know and understand, which is we want to rebel against our parents. <laughs> that's, that's the basic theme, right? That people see in their parents you know, something like, hey, maybe for the boomers, it's you guys are hypocrites or, you know, for the GI, it's actually a funny criticism. It's almost like you guys did too well, right? You put us in these little boxes and you, you've done all this great stuff, but there's an, there's an idea of rebellion, which gets carried across generations. And what I love about your work is that you applied that, that principle and you kind of went way back in history, right? And kind of found this pattern, uh, specifically this kind of hundred year pattern, right? Which tends to end in some sort of uh, crisis, right? Um, you know, my question for you is, you know, there's another, I also consume a bunch of Ray Dalio's work as well. And he describes something, a similar concept, maybe in different language, right? He calls it the long-term debt cycle. And he kind of describes the short-term debt cycle, uh, the long-term debt cycle all over this, this line of productivity. But he kind of comes to a similar conclusion for you, which is about every 80 or so years, there's a great deleveraging within financial markets. So my question to you is, I mean, are you, I'm not sure how familiar you are with Ray's work, but do you see a connection in between kind of the cycles that we see in markets and the cycles that we see in society more broadly? Um, yeah, I do. And I uh, know uh, I do, I do follow Ray Dalio's stuff. Uh, and he, he, <laughs> he has a big team up at Bridgewater and my God, he produces a lot of it. So he I, certainly I does. I, I don't, you know, I don't read every single thing that he has out, but I, I'm, I'm certainly familiar with it. Um, there are one of the things we did in the fourth turning, and I'm actually doing it more in this book that I'm working on now, is uh, creating links, uh, almost like uh, crosswalks between our, our cycle, which is sort of an overall kind of socio-cultural <laughs> cycle, mm. right, of, of, these, uh, of, these, of these moods, uh, the, the social moods that we go through to very specific cycles that people have found in um, the economy, uh, uh, mm -hmm. politics, uh, 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 you know, drug use, family life, culture. So a, a lot of, the, in other words, everyone working in their own field has found cycles. And I, I'm amazed at how, how, how often they overlap. Um, yeah. the, 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 the economic cycle that I think is, is most fundamentally sort of in sync and often discussed in relationship with our cycle is is the basic k wave right sort of the Kondratiev cycle and not so much Kondratiev's original cycle uh, which was heavily influenced by inflation but sort of the more broad of the what's sometimes called the long wave uh, in the economy which is basically two cycles per per secular in other words one of my seculums uh, which which lasts 
you know, in the name in the neighborhood of, of yeah, 80, 80 years or more. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and just for the audience, the saculum, that's the period of time, right? The length of time that these four turnings tend to occur. Exactly. Over. So you, you consider that each turning now, maybe a generation, which is 22. Now it may be a little bit longer, maybe 23 years long. Mm -hmm. uh, so four of those together gets you into the 80, 90 year range, right? Got it. And so two, two Kondratiev cycles back to back kind of make one of these. And, and that really explains why our biggest uh, economic crash, you know, market crashes and sort of economic periods of economic adversity basically coincide with the awakenings and the crises mm. uh, every, every half cycle. So in other words, it's kind of the summer and the winter seasons. The summer season is the awakening, the winter season is the Christ, the civic crisis. Mm. And in fact, you can see just recently, I mean, we, we, we're clearly in a, in, a, in a down part of the cycle now uh with the with the with the gfc the very slow recovery now the pandemic and and uh, we haven't even talked about where we're going now but it, it doesn't look good right at the moment uh for a variety of reasons but my point is is that uh the last period of of extremely bad ec sustained economic performance was was the um was the 1970s uh, early 80s right uh the awakening and before that it was the 1930s it was the last crisis before that, it was the 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 eighteen nineties was a was a was a horrible time, um, uh, and 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 civil war and so on. You go back, you, you see these 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 periods of trouble, uh, and this is in sync with uh, the 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 K wave, and mm -hmm. so I see the the uh, you know Ray Dalio's dead cycle is more of a super you know double K wave cycle almost. That's kind of how I see it, um, and and I must say there are a lot of other cycles which are incredibly in sync. I think one of the most amazing is the cycle of realigning elections. You know these great elections in which hmm. parties sort of realign themselves, um, which which always occurs in American history, either in a crisis uh, or an awakening. I mean, ever since the um, you know, the Federalists and the Republicans through the, the, the Jacksonian, you know, tide, which is another sure. realignment and so on. So you go all the way through. And so uh, there are many of these, there are many of these cycles. Uh, and, and I, I note them, I describe them. I don't, uh, I, I see them as reflections of this basic social cycle, which is generationally driven. One interesting question, or any of these people who come up with these cycles, and, and believe me, it could be anything from crime to drug use to whatever, they come sure. up with these long cycles that they observe, why do they happen? What drives them? What gives them a, a typical periodicity, right? Mm. Uh, no one has a really answer to that. It's just sort of interesting. We observe the cycle. I mean, realigning elections, why do they occur? Why don't they occur every five years? Why don't they occur every hundred years? Um, our, our view contains a, an implicit explanation, and that is, it is generational aging. And that each generation, once it comes of age, takes those values and those behaviors with it to his grave, to a certain extent, right? It doesn't really change after that. It adapts, obviously, and it changes. It gets older, it has different responsibilities as it gets older, but its basic framework of looking at life remains the same. Yeah. And, and so what happens is that eventually the generation which runs things passes away. Uh, and every time you have a crisis, what you find is that everyone who has any living memory of the last crisis is gone. So you wonder why we find it so hard to manage a crisis. Well, everyone that recalls having any right impact on it or who's were invested in the kinds of behavior that got us through the earlier one has disappeared. Well, now uh, actually, it's a very powerful dynamic. I, Neil, I completely agree with you. Uh, I mean, that concept of generational forgetting, I think is so, so powerful. So look, the title of your, your uh, kind of, magnum opus, I'm sure you'll have more magnum opi after, but is the fourth turning, right? And that's the phrase that many people listening to this podcast will be familiar with, you know, and one of, one of the misconceptions, right, about the fourth turning, I feel like as it's popularly used, is that it refers to one event as opposed to an era, 
right? So can you just kind of describe for those on the show who might not be familiar, when, when, you, when you use that phrase, the fourth turning, what are we talking about here? And what should listeners be expecting, I suppose, if we're about to enter one? First of all, I'll just describe what a turning is. A turning is a, is a generation long era. So it's about, you know, over 20 years long. Uh, and it, it refers to, and, and it is, but, but rather than refer to the, a group of people who were born over 20 years, it refers to each era in this time scale, right? Mm. So each turning is an era in which every generation alive is moving into a new phase of life. So right. if you haven't been born yet, you're moving into childhood. You're filling up all the ages between you know, zero and 22, 23 years old, right? And if you're between the ages of zero and 22, you're moving into what we call young adulthood. You know, you, you will all become adults, right? Uh, and you will be, you know, you'll be the sort of the, 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 the active uh, uh, the sort of source of energy in society. You'll be learning all these new tasks and doing all these, all these incredible things, right? But you generally won't be the age where you're actually superintending or having the highest spots managing institutions, right? Uh, we've never had a president, <laughs> at least elected, who, who's been under age 44, for example. So you're, you're going to have older people, and, and that's true even going back, you know, when America was much younger. So we, we always have older people running the society, and that's kind of the next phase of life, which is, is midlife. So, you know, those people will be moving up into midlife. Midlife people will be moving up into elderhood. And, and in elderhood, we now find, you know, people still, you know, exercising often plenty of political power. Uh, mm -hmm. So you see that, that this is what we call the, the, the kind of the turning of the generational constellation. Every generation is kind of moving up into a new social role, right? And, and that aging, once you consider that these generations are, you know, have certain characteristics, again, certain attitudes and behavior, changes the social mood. So when we talk about a turning, we're talking about a long era, over 20 years, in which the whole social mood changes as each of these generations, which have been, which are in the process of being shaped or have already been shaped, moves into a new social role, okay? Now, the fourth turning is the turning that corresponds to the final phase of the saculum, right? That's the crisis phase. That's the civic um, reconstruction phase that we just talked about. These are phases which tend to be associated with um, with uh, a lot of things that uh, that scare us. I mean, these are the great financial crashes. These are the great depressions. These are the great wars. Uh, these are the total wars of American history, right? Uh, historically, uh, these are the you know. If you look abroad, if you look at examples of fourth turnings in other countries, these are the revolutions. These are the civil wars. Well, including a civil war in our own country, mm -hmm. uh, now at least well, two or three over Anglo-American history. A, a lot of people don't realize the American Revolution in the colonies was largely a civil war right, between mm -hmm. Tories and patriots. A lot more Americans killed other Americans during the Revolutionary Era than, than, than Redcoats. <laughs> Let's make that clear. And it was referred to, by the way, at the time. At the time, it was referred to as a civil war in the colonies. Uh, the Patriots, though, were the great propagandists. Winners, though, was right history, right? So we described it as a revolution. <laughs> anyway, that's the way we like to think about it. It, it was a pretty that's bloody, funny. simple conflict. Yeah. But my point is, is that, is that these periods are periods of great kind of civic creative destruction. And, and we fear them, right? I mean, we fear them. No one wants to go through these periods. But I would, I would say that they're essential almost for institutional change. And, and maybe I should say this, in, institutional revitalization or uh, um, the, the rejuvenation, can I say, of institutions. Yeah. Institutions become sclerotic. They become old. Uh, they yeah. become incredibly, totally overcomplicated. They become dysfunctional over time, right? Uh, they become like a, a like a ship covered with barnacles. They no longer function, and so occasionally we need to go through periods where uh, it's kind of like um, you know rivers need floods, clear stuff out. You know, for, uh, uh, forests need fires. You know, to, to clear out underbrush. Society is the same way, uh, and 
we need times when we clear out uh, institutions and allow new institutions to flourish and, and resources to be allocated to new agendas. Um, so I regard fourth turnings as, as, um, as crises. Yeah, they, they include periods, punctuated with periods of extreme crisis, right? Uh, no one likes to go through a depression or a major power war. Uh, on the other hand, they are also periods of, of tremendous rapid institutional growth in which society can solve collective problems, which in other problems seem to be insoluble. And I think that's, 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 the, that's, the, that's the plus side. I think one of the, and I should just say, this, this is kind of a corollary to this. We often think, this is, I think this is a commonly held impression, that the best time to make big institutional changes is when we're affluent, you know, on a sunny day, everyone's feeling great. Well, this is okay. Now we have the resources, we have the, you know, our, 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 our warehouses are filled with grain, right? No one's going to starve. We all feel great about ourselves. Now is the time to make big changes, right? We never do. That never happens that way. We always make our biggest changes during times of crisis. And it's, it's interesting. Um, we founded Social Security, which completely laid the, the cornerstone and actually many of the programs that underlie today's welfare state, right? Uh, everything from you know, what we used to later call the AFTC or ADC to food stamps to SSI to Social Security. We didn't quite get to Medicare yet, but my point is, is that all of these programs were part of the Social Security legislation passed in 1935. <laughs> A great time, right, to create huge institutional changes. And everything that we regard as being the cornerstone of the post-war era in terms of international policy, uh, from Bretton Woods to the UN to the World Bank to the IM, these were all constructed in the late years of World War II. It's kind of incredible when you think about it, right? At a time when we're devoting all these resources for immediate survival and you know, winning a war, a lot of people were dying. We are creating these incredible long-term institutions. During the Civil War, we created the whole state educational system of colleges, right? The whole land grant system. We also, for the first time, created all these new federal forms of transportation, like Transcontinental Railroad and a lot of new federal support for highways. We, we, we nationalized the currency system, the banking system. We did all of these incredible things which took us into the new industrial era. We did it during the war. <laughs> That's yeah. my point. And again and again, when you see when we do these things, uh, we wrote and passed and ratified our constitution at a time of grave crisis when we thought that the, the states weren't united at all. They were about to fly to pieces. I mean, individual states were making treaties with Spain and France and England. I mean, it, it was a terrible period economically and in terms of complete civil discord in this country. And yet we, 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 we ratified this constitution, which we actually created our, our kind of uni unitary system of government in this country. But my point is, <clears throat> we never do those things <laughs> in a time of peace and prosperity. To the contrary, we always fighting, you know, we, we always get incredibly angry at each other, you know, when, when often when things go too well um, and, and the country becomes extremely divided. I do think that in this current period, uh, we see a tribalization of life in America. I think what worries a lot of people is this tribalization maybe into two huge tribes, <laughs> which are mm. opposed to each other. This is kind of the whole red zone, blue zone phenomenon and the sort of polarization of opinion in the United States. Um, civil war is a threat. Uh, it's amazing to me, if you go back 10 years, uh, civil war was not on anyone's radar screen. No one surveyed for it, no one polled on it, no one wrote about it. Today, just in the last year, there have been like three or four really? on, yeah, so sociology of civil war, likelihood of civil war in the United States. A very large share of Americans think of civil war as likely. They think that violence is gonna you know, spark, you know, break out on, on one or both sides. Uh, the, the share of Americans who say that they would, uh, 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 the other party, 
uh, winning the election, this was true in 2020, the, the other party winning the election would, would permanently damage the country, right? Uh, and, and that uh, it's a choice either between, you know, fascism or socialism. Uh, this is now most Americans in this country. Participation rates in politics have skyrocketed. Uh, more Americans participated, you know, starting in, in, it started ramping up in 2016, but 2018 and 2020 with the highest presidential and midterm election participation rates going back more than 100 years. And it's amazing. You, you go back only 10 or 15, 12 years ago, the biggest problem in American life I was complaining about was participation. No one's engaged in politics. Well, say what you want about Trump. He solved that problem, right? <laughs> Everyone now uh, cares about who wins at the national level. There's no ticket splitting anymore in America. You notice that? Everyone's mm -hmm. voting a straight ticket, either Democrat or Republican. Um, and I think this last, this last election in 2020, there were no split delegations, all this, at least in, in terms of senators. All senators came from states which, you know, Republican senators have voted for Trump, all Democrats have voted for Biden. So this, this polarization and this even geographic um, uh, sorting of regions today in America. Uh, there's a great book on this, by the way, by Bill Bishop called The Big Sort came out. He's actually doing a new version of this. But the fact that Americans today are self-sorting. I mean, everyone's moving. To, if, you're, if you believe in the blue zone, you want to be with your own track. If you believe the red zone, you want to move to your own track. Uh, so the sorting is going on in America, and what it's doing is it creating more extremes in each area, right? And they begin to amplify each other's views until absolutely no one who lives in a Trump region knows anyone who voted for Biden or vice versa. And I think that's increasingly common. So this is a dangerous, I think everyone agrees, this unsettles almost everyone. And Americans now are becoming very pessimistic in their long-term forecasts about what's happening to America in that regard, right? Um, I think the economic situation, both the slowdown and living standard growth, as well as its uh, inequitable distribution, is also very concerning to most Americans today. Um, and, and this has fed populist branches on both parties, right? Certainly it's fed a lot of the populism on the, on the Republican side, as well as a lot of the populism on the progressive or left side of the Democratic Party. And now you have this whole situation in the Ukraine that's kind of the one missing ingredient of, of many four attorneys in America is suddenly on the table, right? Uh, suddenly now we're worried about uh, a great power confrontation. Well, this is all happening uh, kind of on our timetable, right? I mean, I hate to say it. I mean, I, I take no pleasure in this, but again, I come back uh, and to this point that the most this is because I, I sometimes get that people say, gee, your, your, your fourth turning scenario just sounds so pessimistic, right? And I sometimes, my response to that, uh, Michael, is sometimes to say, I know of nothing more pessimistic than to think of today's trends, right? Uh, slowing economic growth, you know, pumped up markets, you know, for those who have a lot of wealth, um, uh, a lack of any sense of opportunity in America. And in particularly rapid deterioration of the growth prospects of younger people in America. And this, this, this splitting or this polarization of, America, of political attitudes in America going on indefinitely. I mean, that's like, I can't think of anything more pessimistic than that. Mm -hmm. So my point is, is that, uh, and, and the complete inability of our society to grapple with any longer term issue of any type at all, right? Because we're, we're just simply trying to survive the day-to-day -day and, and, and help our own side, right? The, kind of the, the gridlocking of, of our social system. That to me is a pretty dismal prospect. Mm -hmm. And, and fourth turnings do solve that, right? One way or another, they get us beyond that. And I, I think that's the lesson of history as well. This episode is brought to you by Fireblocks. I talk to a lot of fast growing crypto native funds, crypto banks, exchanges and the like, and they all tell me they have the same two problems. One, their treasury management setup sucks. They've got analysts wasting time and money on manual transactions. Two, they are not happy with their current security setup. They're sharing passwords, they're sending test transactions, and they're worried that their funds might be at risk. 
Fireblocks is a platform that solves all of that for you. They're a one-stop shop portal, which automatically plugs into exchanges, trading venues, etc. They source deep liquidity and solve everything from day-to-day -day crypto transactions all the way down to complex DeFi strategy. And the best thing about Fireblocks is that they offer scalable solutions with industry-leading technology. Doesn't matter if you're a two-person crypto fund or a 2,000-person crypto exchange, these guys have you covered. And the last thing that I'll say about this company is that I have known them for years. They are a high integrity team. They ship product like no other. I would trust them with my own funds. So click the link at the bottom of this page and tell them that I sent you. Very, very important that you click the link at the bottom here. Otherwise, they're not going to know that I sent you. And then how am I going to get credit? So help a brother out. Click the link at the bottom of this episode. Tell them I sent you. I think I read, right, the, the, your sort of prediction was, right, the, the fourth turning, this, the fourth turning of this particular sacrum was going to start around 2005, right? So I guess my, my open question to you, right, a lot of little problems going around, right? We had the great financial crisis, we had COVID, we have the war breaking out in Ukraine. Do you view us as being in a fourth turning right now? And my second question to you is, because we've been kind of dancing around this topic, is, you know, a lot of the wackiness, um, you know, I think in, at least in America, can kind of be traced to... Uh, and globally as well, is central banking and monetary policy, right? Ultra loose accommodative policy, which has led to these pumped up markets and inequality and all that kind of stuff. So two part question, do you think we find ourselves in a fourth turning right now? If so, what is the role or connection, if any, with central banking in that? These are both good questions. Um, uh, the answer is yes, we're clearly in, in, a, in a fourth turning now or what I call the crisis era. And I, I think it started in 2008 with the GFC. Uh, mm -hmm. That's by far our worst uh, financial crash since the since the uh, you know crash of twenty nine, um, and I think we we inherited a period after that of extremely disappointing um, uh, GDP per capita growth. Uh, in fact, this has been the lowest growth decade over decade since the nineteen thirties. So anyway, that's the basic parallel there, and I think um, and then of course we've had additional shocks after that. We had the pandemic, the pandemic recession, and now we're headed into this uh, uh, very um, uh, disturbing era. And, and, and I would say all those things sort of in the economic framework have been matched by this weirdness in our adjustment to lower economic growth, which is uh, keeping economic, keeping, the, keeping the, the recession from being worse than it was, by pumping up markets. I totally agree yeah. with that as part of the plan. That's kind of, you know, quantitative easing, um, uh, uh, kind of, and quantitative easing kind of on steroids during the pandemic, uh, because then you had fiscal coming at the same time and the Fed actually buying up <laughs> junk bonds and, 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 and even, uh, 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 and even uh, uh, equities, right, for the first time. So, um, so that answer is yes, and I think uh, it will extend probably till around, uh, possibly slightly beyond the year 2030, right? So that's my timetable. So that'd be 22, 23 years, okay? Question number one. <laughs> Question number two, central banks. Um, this is an interesting one, and I do believe uh, the, 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 the proverbial uh, rubber hits the road on that over the next year, right? Uh, because this policy by central banks of quantitative easing or being, I could say, another way of putting it is being complicit in the policy of, of, of what's sometimes been called modern monetary theory, right? Which is basically um, uh, in just keep expanding the money supply uh, until you run into inflation, right? Uh, you know, in other words, it's okay if you run enormous deficits and the central bank can monetize all that. Uh, you don't have to worry about any of that as long as you don't have inflation. And I agree, that makes sense. Uh, you'd, you'd be a curmudgeon not to just print extra dollars and spend it on someone <laughs> if it's not gonna lead to inflation. It's like creating wealth. I mean, if I can create another billion dollars and just uh, have something that otherwise wouldn't exist and there's no inflation, so no one gets hurt, uh, why wouldn't you do that? <laughs> You know, unless yes. you're Mr. unless you're Mr. Scrooge or something, right? <laughs> so, but even the modern monetary theory people say that yeah, but you can't really. You have to stop doing that, or you have to work the other way when there's inflation, right? Well, now we have inflation, and to me, that is one of the enormous challenges coming up this year. I, I we see enormous headwinds. First of all, 
all of the the year over year cops so the comparables in terms of uh, you know industrial production GDP growth everything is suddenly going to be negative now because we had such huge growth last year so everything is looked bad on a year to year basis coming up uh, and you start seeing some of these uh, uh, long term indicators slowing and here's the problem. These year to year slowing indicators are moving right into uh, monetary tightening, right? With Joe and Powell, who, who needs to tighten. And he, they really have no choice. Um, uh, Powell is now confirmed at the Fed. Uh, and I think no central banker wants to go down in history as being known to the guy who failed to control inflation and yeah. set, in, set in store crises later on. He doesn't want to be the next you know, Arthur Burns of the Fed, right? Who, who then required a, a Volcker later on. I think he wants to be the Volcker now, right? Um, and I must say, it looks worse than ever now with, with Ukraine and with uh, gas prices exploding. And we, we saw it, uh, we saw, you know, uh, well over 7% now in this last year over year, and it might even be higher. So the problem is the, the economy is slowing down, which ought to actually slow inflation. But all these other things might continue to have inflation grow. And what's happening, too, is long term inflation expectations are exploding. And that's just happened just in the last you know, two or three weeks. We're now up. This is called the, the 10 year break even. And it's basically comparing the, the 10 year treasury with the with the with the tips, you know, the inflation yep. protected treasury. And that's now at at two at uh, at uh, two point nine percent. Right, so it's gone up another percentage point almost just in the last you know few weeks. So now the the real interest rate, if you consider that the real interest rate, we're back to, to something like minus 0.9 or 0.1. So basically, the Fed stance now, as is corrected inflation grows, has become enormously stimulative, right? And that's a further problem for for, for uh, Powell, because he has to get in front of that, right? You can't just let that continue, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so he's gonna have to get in front of that. But the problem is that this year, we're also moving into a tremendous fiscal wall. We had one of the largest deficits of the, um, uh, well, frankly, the largest deficits since World War II in 2020 and 2021. And we're moving, that was a, something like, uh, uh, you know, almost 12% of GDP deficit, right? And we're moving back to just over 3%, right? So we have another 8.5% of GDP, either increased taxes or mostly just decreased spending, right? No more stimmies, no, no more stimulus checks. Mm -hmm. All that stuff is stopping. So we know what the macro effect of that, right? That slows the economy. At the same time, the Fed is rising. At the same time, you've got you know, the Ukraine thing, China right now is not doing well at all. It's got COVID, it's, it's you know, the Shanghai is tanking. This is looking to be a very bad time, right, in these next uh, couple of quarters. And the reason why it's bad is the ordinary escape hatches, uh, which is Fed loosening, you know, and the old Fed put, right? Don't worry about the markets going down. Or, you know, we'll be able to cut things. We'll be, I think that's over now. I think mm -hmm. we can't resort to that. So what you said was absolutely correct. That was the policy, is that the Fed always intervened to protect markets. I don't think they intervene now. And what's really disturbing is that I don't think that, and fiscal policy, I don't think is gonna get any more expansionary, uh, simply because you know Washington is gridlocked, right? I don't think they made any changes. Uh, we're, going into a, we're going into a midterm. I think after the midterm, I think Biden's could essentially be you know, is going to one or possibly both houses are going to be no longer democratic, right? And at that time, I think he, he has sent, yeah, I think he's already a lame duck president. I don't think Biden's going to run again, uh, realistically. Uh, so you have two leaderless parties. <laughs> I mean, it's it's not a nice scenario, right? You have you have two parties that essentially don't have any consensus leader at all, um, and uh, and the political system, I think kind of in complete gridlock after this after this midterm, unless something dramatic happens. Uh, so I don't think you're gonna have an easy escape hatch on the fiscal side. I, I may be drawing a dismal picture here, but you know, cheer me up. Uh, maybe maybe you have some ideas about how it's gonna how it's gonna turn out differently. But I don't see this as a as a great picture. 
uh, going into this coming year. Yeah, I actually really like the way you phrase that, which is I can't think of anything more pessimistic than the current state of affairs to continue exactly as they are, right? Low growth environment, this general polarization in the US, I, I think something eventually has to give. Um, I would prefer if it didn't give in massive war conflict, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I think at the other side of that, right, is, is actual genuine improvement. And, you know, I suppose my question to you, you know, just to, to close is, I'm not sure how much work you've done kind of looking at the millennial generation, the Gen Z generation overall, but kind of when you look at the younger generations in America, I mean, right, this is the one that's going to grow and come of age during the fourth turning. What are your thoughts on that generation? I mean, are they, is it surprising to you in the way they act? How would you characterize them? Like, are they I guess specifically Gen Z versus millennials, do you see difference? Like, what do you kind of see in the youth today? I'd be very curious to get your opinion. Uh, yeah, well, you know, look, I mean, <laughs> as a subject I've written a lot about, needless to say, uh, did a book actually on millennials back in 2000, uh, mm. you know, millennials rising. Um, and, and uh, you know, as, as you probably know, Bill and I invented the, the word millennial. So I did that, not know that. I feel embarrassed that I've not known that. Oh my yeah, gosh, no, that's that, so cool. That, that, was, that was in Generations, our first book, 1991. Mm. So if you want to know where the label comes from, it comes from us. Um, wow. So you know, we're, cool. we're the guys you can blame. Uh, mm. And believe me, if you look at my Twitter feed, people do blame me for that. Uh, <laughs> and it really, you know, naming Generations an interesting game, I, I just I don't care a lot about it. Uh, uh, no, the reason why we, we, we saw this incredible differences between, uh, you know, we wrote that really, uh, we, we did our drafts in, in the late 1980s, uh, around 1990, and we saw that even as little kids, these kids were being raised entirely differently than Xers, you know, back as, as kids in the 70s, right, and, and sort of the older kids then of 1990, we saw this amazing generational divide, right, and we've seen that divide before, that typically what happens after this so-called, you know, reactive or nomad generation who get, you know, completely abandoned as kids. And suddenly we have this moral panic over children and then everyone's down into love. Everyone needs, you know, a seatbelt and a baby on board sign. And, you know, these kids are the most precious things in the world. And, you know, these, uh, these uh, cuddly baby movies instead of all those child's double movies. And, and in other words, that huge change that we saw is something we've seen before in history. So we knew what that was. Uh, and, and we said, well, this is gonna be kind of an amazing difference. We thought the first cohort was really affected by that. It seemed clear, it was born around 1982. This was the high school class of 2000, right? Hence the name millennial, if you wanna know where that comes from. So basically your, your initial millennial cohort was the high school class of 2000. So it kind of gave rise to that. And that was a time as you remember when, when you had uh, the, all the boy bands and the Backstreet Boys and you know, suddenly you had sure do. all the sure high do. school musicals and all. So it's, it's a completely different culture that no one associated with Xers when they were that age, right? So mm. anyway, everything began to shift. And we, we, we also did a book on this generation later on called Millennials Rising, which came out in 2000 uh, about you know, uh, all the traits with millennials. You know, they're special, they're risk averse, they're, they're attached to their parents. They're, they're very family oriented. They're, uh, they're, they're collectively confident and there are, um, their, risk, their risk aversion is famous. Uh, and uh, we, we talk a lot about that. And it's given rise to many, many very welcome traits, right? Like committing a lot less crime. Uh, and uh, that's kind of the sea change we've seen. Uh, anyone who doesn't understand or appreciate that uh, did not live in a big city back in the 1980s. <laughs> I guess anyone who did knows the difference, right? Uh, however much you might complain about what's going on today. Um, uh, I, I did actually live in New York City <laughs> in the mid 80s. Uh, so we've seen these huge changes. And, and uh, I think that they will, I think the only, the only uh, frustration from millennials is how they're, um, they're, 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 their potential for teamwork. I think that's another aspect of this generation, the strong ability to band together and do collective things and to want to do collective things, right? Organize, you know, um, has been completely untapped by, by older generations, right? Um, there's no way in which uh, younger people are asked to do things for the community, really, except go out and volunteer kind of on your own, right? 
But there are no institutions that really encourage that. I mean, uh, even military is now sort of mercenary. You know, it's sort of, you know, we, we hire a select bunch of people to go out and do these things. I think actually it's fascinating. One thing I've seen millennials really respond to are all these videos in Ukraine of these guys saying, yeah, I used to be a cook. I used to be a poet. I used to be a healthcare worker. But now I'm a... I'm, I'm fighting, you know, and they, they, they get 30 seconds instruction as how you do the Kalashnikov, you know, <laughs> and a bunch of bullets and they're off to the front. I think that has been an absolute epiphany for millennials. It's like, yeah, just people like us were suddenly being asked to participate in something bigger, right? And um, I think that's, that's been sort of a, a you know, a, a, an interesting insight into what makes what's happening in the Ukraine uh, so fascinating to is ordinary citizens can make that difference. And I, I do think that's, that's the tragedy, but you know, that's another thing that the fourth turning solves because ultimately it cannot help but give this generation an opportunity, uh, although many of them, uh, albeit a somewhat belated one, um, uh, the same was true of World War II, by the way, uh, to, to uh, to fulfill, you know, those those ambitions, uh, to to do something profound, to actually change their community, this country, possibly even the world, rather than just spend all your time, you know, for some boss, you know, improving their, uh, you know, you know, brand attractiveness on some BS product that nobody cares about, right? I'm with you. I, uh, you know. Part of what you said just really resonated. So my grandpa uh, fought in Iwo Jima in World War II. I recently, I've known that, I recently learned from my mom that he left college with one semester left to go volunteer to fight in the war. And that blew my mind because I just can't imagine doing that. I just, I can't imagine what he must have felt like at that time because that's such a foreign feeling for me. I suppose it was just a very stark reminder that like, man, it must've just been a really different national feeling at that given point in time. Well, remember that, um, you know, America, it wasn't just, it wasn't like any of the kinds of conflicts that we fought that we've seen in our lifetimes, right? This was a conflict that seemed existential uh, for mm -hmm. the country. Um, you remember that uh, uh, Japan dominated the Pacific uh, dominated the Indian Ocean. Uh, it just uh, uh, and 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 uh, the, the 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 you know Germany and 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 Italy. It, it completely kind of wiped out any opposition on the mainland Europe, and it was moving into uh, uh, it was moving into the to the Soviet Union. It looked as though, uh, and you know, FDR did that in his fireside chats. He, he talked about how you know once once Britain goes. Here are the various ways in which the, the Germans could kind of come into Greenland. Are they going to come over into Brazil? And, you know, we're, we don't have any effective Navy. We don't have any effective to, to stop anyone from doing anything right now. Um, and it was uh, and it was as existential. And I think the, the other question was, if we if if there are no other democracies in the world. Right. Which at that time, we were practically just down to us uh, and a few other, you know, Anglophone countries uh, like you know, Canada and Australia. But the question was, who would help us anymore? Right. You know, and, and so there was this great, and I think there's a little bit of feeling about that about Ukraine. Uh, the sense that we waited so long to respond. We looked the other way. We really didn't want to see it, right? And you have, uh, you know, you have uh, Vladimir Putin in Russia, who's, you know, openly assassinated people in other countries all around the world and everyone kind of knows it uh and he's the the tactics we're now seeing by the way in ukraine uh of just bringing in all of the uh you know the russian uh, uh artillery and just blasting cities into submission uh, well he already did those he's he's demonstrated those he did those in grozny when he when he uh, subdued chechnya and he and he he did that and helped organize it in a, in assad syria uh, just look what they did to Aleppo, right? I mean, they just brought in and they basically just blasted the smithereens. They, they, they didn't have terror attack. This was part of it. Uh, but my point is, we all saw it. We even created red lines. You remember, you remember the famous red line? Uh, yeah. So, but, but we chose to ignore it because we thought, 
well, it was always an exception. You know, he'll come to reason and this history is moving basically the other way, right? Uh, and, and I think suddenly we wake up and you say, no, maybe history isn't moving that way. You know, look around the world. Who is running governments around the world, right? Is this history- realization too recently. I, I had this realization too recently. It's like, man, you know, I, I live in a bubble. I live in America, right? I live in the Northeast of America. Uh, and I realized recently, I was like, wow, when you look around the other great powers, not all democracies at all, actually. Um, well, some, of the, some of the biggest ones. I mean, you see that a lot of the large countries of the world who are run by kind of populists who appeal only to the sort of ethno center of their country. Uh, Narendra Modi and Xi Jinping. Let's just start with those two. <laughs> then you add, uh, you know, then you add Russia, then you add a whole bunch of other countries. Uh, and you begin to realize, uh, you know, uh, from, from Central and Eastern Europe and many of them additional ones in Southeast Asia, you could add, and you begin to realize this is not <laughs> where history has to end up, right? And that, um, and by the way, this millennial quest for order and for security and for the collective can be answered by an authoritarian regime as well as by a democracy. Don't assume that these traits necessarily lead to a democracy. And in fact, I would say that the the, the this this millennial these millennial attitudes we notice right of wanting more collectivized social systems and more security. Uh, rather than just always opportunity, uh, is global in these younger people. The greatest distrust now with democracy, if you look in uh, uh, the uh, Cambridge University has a wonderful democracy index, and they'll just show you, the greatest dissatisfaction is with younger people. They're the ones who most believe that democracy does not do anything for them. It just, you know, it, it empowers older and richer people, right? Mm-hmm. And so this move toward the collectivist, is not just, it's not that only the young are participating, I'd say the young are actually out in front in this in many ways. The, the real question is not whether we won't in some ways collectivize certain things, but whether that's going to be orchestrated by a democracy or not. See what I mean? Neil, I could keep talking about this with you for hours, but unfortunately our time is running to a close here. Uh, guys, Listeners of the show, I highly, highly recommend you check out Neil's works. Uh, you can probably hear it in my voice. It's been a fascinating conversation for me. Neil, if folks want to find out more about you and what you do, what is the best way to do that? Um, you know, look, uh, we have a retail product. Uh, I, I'd say most of my, most of the, most of the people I, 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 I talk to are, are institutional investors uh, that we do through a hedge eye. Uh, so that's actually H-E-D-G-E-Y-E. Uh, and uh, I have a product called Demography Unplugged um, that comes out daily. So if you're interested in that, you can subscribe. Um, I, I, yeah, so Demography Unplugged. And most of the time when I'm not working on my book, I also do a, uh, I do a podcast. You can also uh, join me on Twitter. I'm at um, uh, How Generation. So just, you know, my last name, Generation. <laughs> Pretty easy to remember. Um, and, uh, and look for, uh, the new book that's coming out. Um, our sales on fourth turning have sort of exploded, I'd say over the last two years. Um, uh, and it's an old book, but I, I will have a new book out coming out at the end of the year. Uh, it, we haven't named it yet, but I think it will be, I mean, it's, you know, I, I know what it is. Uh, and it's basically taking this whole paradigm, uh, deepening it a little bit and taking it all the way up till today. One thing I do, by the way, in this book uh, that you will like is I take all of the generational discussion in the fourth turning up to today. So we age the generations forward. Wow, I love it. That's very cool. Uh, Neil, this has been an absolute pleasure. I didn't, I had all these questions for you on demographics and uh, US versus China and ascending empires versus descending. That's how you know it's a good conversation because I didn't even get to any of my questions. I know. Uh, <laughs> There's never enough time. Yeah, uh, but it was a blast. Uh, we'll have to have you again on sometime in the future. Thank you so much for doing this. Great. You're welcome.